quick look. Okay. okay, welcome everybody. I think we're finally uh, able to get going here. So again, this is Crystal Hall with the Iowa After School Alliance. Looks like we have a, a small but mighty crowd today on this Thanksgiving week. Um, Brittany Samuelson is here with me as well. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, we are going to be presenting uh, on our conference information that Brittany and I received when we were recently in Colorado for the Rural After School Engagement Conference, which was held uh, in Beaver Creek, sponsored by the Vale Valley Foundation. So at any time, if anybody has questions, again, use the chat box or go ahead and, and pipe in. What we'd like to do is just provide a summary of the workshops that we went to and per, hopefully you'll have some ideas that you can take away from today's call. So first, uh, the first session that Crystal and I went to together, it was part of the pre-conference, was a session on trauma-informed care. Um, I know we've done some trainings about trauma-informed care in the state, so you all are probably pretty familiar on the topic. Um, but I think one of the biggest takeaways um, was a quote that the speaker uh, shared right at the beginning, and that was, if kids are mad or if kids are sad, they can't add. So I think that really just goes to show that if kids aren't emotionally stable and emotionally ready to learn, then you won't get very far with them. And so it's really important to take care of their social and emotional needs um, first so that they can really get that academic enrichment that you all are providing through your programming. So when we speak about trauma-informed care, um, it's important to know what trauma is. So the speaker described trauma as a psychological response to an event that is emotionally distressing and can override a person's ability to cope. The thing is, though, is that trauma looks different for different people. Two kids can experience the same kind of trauma and have very different reactions to them, um, to that trauma. Um, one might be able to cope very well, another might be able to um, might not be able to have those same coping skills. And so it's important to realize that when you're working with these kids, they'll um, all have different um, reactions to any trauma they've faced in their lives. And then an interesting fact that we learned is that children in poverty, children of color, and children in rural communities, this was one that was surprising to me, um, they have, they're more likely to experience trauma than other kids. And then children with disabilities as well are more likely to experience trauma. Um, and then she also pointed out, the speaker also pointed out that young children can also experience trauma. Um, I think we sometimes, when we're thinking about young children and early childhood, especially babies, you know, I at least feel like, oh, they don't really know what's going on. They're young, you know, their brains are still forming. They, they're still making sense of the world. They don't really understand this. But science shows that they do understand trauma and it does shape the way that their brain works and the way that their brain functions. And so um, even though we're all in the after school space, I think it's also important to realize that this is um, something that affects the early childhood space, too, and can um, stick with the kids if they've experienced early childhood trauma. It'll stick with them and may be displayed in your after school programming, too. And then, so while trauma does impact the brain, um, it shapes the brain, it's, it can be reversed. And so that's the good news out of all of this. When we're talking about trauma-informed care, um, we can reverse the impacts of trauma and um, our kids can be resilient. So trauma can be diminished or reversed by having a caring adult, which I know you all are, and you all um, try to foster those caring adults in your programs with your staff. And so when we talk about caring adults, we look at our kids through a lens of what happened to you instead of what's wrong with you. Um, if kids are acting out in class or in the program, it can be so easy to jump to what's wrong with you, let's discipline you, instead of thinking about um, what happened to you, what happened at home, what's going on with you um, that makes you act out. Uh, when kids act out in your programs, I think it's, important to remember too that they're probably doing that because they feel safe there. It's a safe place for them to act out, um, whereas they might not be able to 
really show their emotions at home, at school, or in the after school program. They feel safe around you, so they really feel like they can let those emotions out, even if it's not in a positive way. And when we're disciplining youth um, that have experienced trauma, um, or just any youth, I think, because sometimes we don't know if kids have experienced trauma, it's important to avoid exclusionary tactics um, because it might be triggering for the youth or it might be re traumatizing for them. If you, um, if they're acting out in the program and you send them out into the hall or tell them to go home for the day, it makes them feel like they're not part of the community, um, that they don't have anyone to turn to, which can really escalate behaviors instead of um, diminishing behaviors like the goal is. Um, and then so some other tactic, tactics and positive tactics instead are to create safe environments, create schedules that make kids feel safe. They know what to expect every day when they come to program. Um, have calm down spaces, not for you to send kids to, like to the principal's office or, you know, not a disciplinary space, but um, a place where they can go to calm down, get away from everyone, um, get away from the stimulation and um, relax a little bit and de-escalate themselves. And then also um, use some feeling identification activities so that you can see how um, youth are feeling when they come into your program every day and you can get that um, kind of a thermometer for each of your kids. And I know that we have done um, uh, trainings across the state on conscious discipline and I think conscious discipline fits uh, really well into this model of trauma-informed care um, and some of these activities uh, that are recommended when dealing, um, when working with kids who have experienced trauma. And then I think something new we learned from this training um, was this concept of secondary trauma. So secondary trauma is the real impact of indirect exposure to traumatic or difficult stories. So it's possible that you or some of your staff members are experiencing these secondary traumas if kids come to program and they start telling you about um, domestic violence that happened in their home the night before, that has an effect on the person that's hearing that story um, from the child. And so it's important to make sure your staff has a self-care plan for themselves to figure out how they're going to cope with trauma, um, the secondary trauma as well. And we received this handout that we wanted to share with you all about secondary trauma. You can download it in the files section. Um, and I think Crystal's trying to pull it up here. And anyway, though, it shares some different symptoms of secondary trauma. And so you can share this with your staff so they can understand um, if they might be experiencing secondary trauma and um, having some of those um, symptoms and feelings that go along with it. Um, and then there's, I believe, a questionnaire, too, that helps them um, understand what self-care might look like or come up with a plan for themselves. And we're trying to pull it up here, but having some problems. So um, these files are saved in the Adobe Connect, and you'll be able to download those and share those with your staff um, after this webinar. And Crystal's working on getting it back up here, too, I think. Hold on one second. <laughs> you can tell that with Michelle not here, <laughs> we've got some, oh, here we go. We're figuring it out. We have some. Um, 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 learning, it's a learning curve for us in this new system. So, okay, we've got the PowerPoint app back up, and um, like I said, these files will be shared um, with you all, and they can be accessed. You can download them now if you look to the bottom right corner of your screen in the Files tab. You can download that PDF on secondary trauma. Okay. <clears throat> So the open session of the conference was led by Matthew 
I never say his name right. I'm sorry. Immersion. Immersion. Yes. Um, who may, the name may or may not be familiar to everybody. He was an individual who had a very interesting life story that uh, later took those experiences and developed the Every Monday Matters curriculum. I would highly suggest that you Google this to see if this might be something that you could implement within your school or your after school site. The curriculum really focuses on uh, youth peer to peer and peer to adult connection. Um, it's also, a, a, it's just a very positive way in, to create a culture of belonging within your programming. The focus on this program is, is giving back, and that can mean different things on different levels. So it could be as formal as community service. It could be as informal as recognizing the individual traits and characteristics of youth that make them uh, unique in who they are. So one thing that they asked us to do at the conference, which uh, was an interesting thing to do with a room full of adults, was to introduce your, yourself and saying, you know, my name is Crystal and I matter because. So we had to come up with reasons that we mattered uh, and share those with other people from the additional 26 states who were in attendance at this conference. As you can imagine, the adults, uh, some of them took to it immediately, while others maybe found it a little bit unnerving to be uh, that straightforward with a complete stranger. But what we really appreciated about this is because many youth don't necessarily take time and are not necessarily recognized for what makes them great or what makes them unique. This can be a really nice way to build that sense of belonging into your program. And who knows, you may be surprised at why a youth thinks they matter. And then you can use that information to support their whole child development. And I would also just add, I think it's a great activity to do with the youth in your program, but it could also be a great activity to do with your staff, too. Mm -hmm. I think in after school, we talk a lot about how we can support kids, but you all work so hard in the programs, and I think you use a lot of your emotional energy. Um, and I think this is a great activity to help build everyone up and realize um, what their purpose is and what they can contribute to not only the program, but your, your overall community and um, the world, really. Are there any questions so far regarding the, the first two open sessions? Okay, we'll keep moving then. So the first breakout session that I attended was called Genius Hour Student-Led Learning. It was um, a program, a weekly program that's provided by uh, the local library um, in the area that we were at. And so this was a program that they, the library came up with um, to help serve the most amount of kids with minimal staff capacity. And so that the solution they came up with for that was student-led learning. Um, and so what they do is they provide the students with the tools they need um, to have the academic component. So they talk about the scientific method. Um, you know, coming up with a hypothesis, experimenting, gathering information, measurements, results, and then going back to the drawing board and figuring out um, if your hypothesis was um, approved or denied um, throughout the process. And then they also teach about the engineering design process, which is similar to the scientific method, um, but more about building. And then they let kids run with it. They provide all sorts of different um, materials, and it can be they had little robots they shared with us. Um, but they also talked about how some of the most popular materials in this program are um, old cardboard boxes that people donate to the program and construction paper and markers. So it can really be done with minimal amounts of funding, or um, if you have some extra funding to spend on um, more STEM activities, you could do it that way. But you really provide youth with um, an hour to build and um, explore and do what's interesting to them. And as a facilitator, you can prompt them with questions like, what is a need in my life or in my community that I could solve with this tool? Um, how does this work? How can I reverse engineer this? So what they'll do is people will donate um, old TVs that no longer work to this program, and then they'll let the kids rip them apart and see how they function. And, 
um, in a safe way, make sure that it's not plugged in and <laughs> nobody could get hurt, but let them reverse engineer it and see how things work and, um, and make something of their own out of those parts. And so this is really all about letting the kids decide what they want to learn about that day. Some of the kids that really aren't into building and into creating, maybe they'll take on a research project. They're at the library, so they have all sorts of books on different animals or different um, countries that the kids can choose to learn about that day. And so it's really led by the students. And then as a program director or program staff, you're just there to facilitate ask them those questions to remind them about the scientific method and um, really get them to reflect on what they're doing. So I put in a little schedule here um, so you could see how they format the club. Like I said, it's about 60 to 70 minutes each week. And then I've listed a lot of different resources that you can look into um, to create real world problems for them to solve with these activities or just different ideas um, and tips for structuring student-led learning and facilitating that process. Okay. So the first workshop that I went to was called Leveraging a System of Support, which was supporting professional development in rural communities. Uh, the presenter for this particular lesson was out of Nebraska, uh, and specifically their 21st century site in Nebraska. And I thought she also used a great quote uh, that is very applicable across any type of work you do with kids. So she had stated that although kids don't write your paycheck, they are still who you work for. The thing that I took away from this particular workshop is that many of the conversations that we as the Alliance have had with each and every one of you regarding your professional development needs uh, could really be transferred to Nebraska. There was also represented representatives from Colorado, Indiana, Texas, uh, a few other states too. And I guess the comforting thing for me was that everybody seemed to have very similar uh, needs for professional development. So it sounds like collectively there might be an initiative to try to shore up some of those needs, which is a very exciting thing for us here in Iowa. So when they talked specifically about the gaps in professional development that they were experiencing in Nebraska and then how they were working to close them, they talked about leadership skills for support staff, which I think actually came up in our last program support committee meeting uh, just a few weeks ago. In Nebraska, they're actually building in some weekly opportunities for staff to practice those skills using those existing individuals as experts. So it might be a school personnel, it could be a community partner, um, but what they did is they did a kickoff training event that maybe you know, was a half day or a full day, and then each week they build in those weekly sessions to say, okay, today we're going to practice on uh, working with a difficult situation. How, how did you experience this this week? How did you navigate those different um, issues or barriers or obstacles? And then what they do is they collectively brainstorm it as a team or as a staff. And I thought that that was a really nice way of taking, uh, taking that professional development to the next level in that weekly implementation. Another thing that they talked about was um, needing lesson planning support for non-school sites, which of course we have here in Iowa too. So um, some states are, are different from Iowa in that they only award 21st century dollars to school districts. Obviously here in Iowa, we have funds that go to school districts, but we also have funds that go to community partners. And when you are a community partner site, and maybe your staff has tons of youth development experience, but perhaps they don't have that background in education, how can you ensure that your lesson plans are of the highest quality so we can start moving that needle in your literacy and math scores? So in this particular situation, what they did in Nebraska was they included a peer review plan partnership. So the, their uh, community partner or person who maybe did not have the skill set needed would, was partnered with a peer reviewer associated with the school district 
to review those lesson plans and provide tips and tricks and hints to make sure that the alignment with the school day was appropriate and that the skill level was appropriate with the kids. I know some of our sites actually do something very similar here in Iowa, and I also know that other community partnership sites maybe even contract with um, certified teachers for their after school program. So I think that we have a, a pretty good handle on things here within Iowa, but I always, I always think there's room for improvement and there might be some uh, additional guidelines that could come from Nebraska as they navigate that process that we could implement here. The last need that they experienced was how to evaluate their staff more effectively. And one thing that they have chosen to do is to implement use of a journal or a writing selection as an evaluative tool. Um, this was a bit of a new concept to me. So I, I did actually uh, reach out to the presenter to get some more information about that. But as of the time of this webinar, I, I don't have a response from her. So if that's something that I think warrants uh, further discussion through another conference call, or we could possibly take it to a committee, um, please keep your eye on the iowa21cclc.com website for maybe more information coming for that in the future. Um, additional things that they had done in Nebraska, which I think could also be really easily implemented here in Iowa, and if you need support to do this, this is why Brittany and I are here for you, is they use colleges in their area for both traditional and non-traditional learning opportunities. Um, and ultimately what that meant was that the, the traditional, of course, was if the colleges or universities were doing seminars, classes, workshops, they had partnered with their after school program to invite that those staff members to come and participate in those. With a where a more non-traditional approach would be something as simple as uh, asking a, a college staff to help review lesson plans or to provide some guidance on a particular issue. They also use technology for statewide and regional approaches, and uh, Brittany and I will practice on how to get better <laughs> using our technology platforms. And then they used community service events as a way of supporting their professional development. So one thing that they talked about was really, really building in that sense of team by taking a, a community service project day and building it into a leadership exercise. And I thought that was a really nice way too of, you know, making sure that the bonds within your staff for after school programming can be stronger so that they can better serve kids. I think we're going to pause here for a moment because again, we've, we've spoken about two different workshops and we want to be sure that people are getting questions answered. So again, if you have questions or need more information about it, something that we've spoken about, please use the chat box or you can speak up through this, the phone system. Okay. So the next session that I attended was Youth Voice in Action. And I think that Youth Voice can be a really great tool for all levels of programming, but especially for older youth, um, especially high schoolers, if you're wanting to get high schoolers more involved in your after school programming um, or start a program for after or for high schoolers, I think uh, Youth Voice really gives them the opportunity to participate in activities that they're interested in and that can really make a difference in their community. Um, so just to get a baseline here, Youth Voice is when um, you allow youth to have an active role in planning your programming um, and developing solutions for a real world problem, uh, really giving them a deep role in the program, not just something surface level like, oh, who do you want to partner with today, but something that's really um, meaningful for them. And I think it'll help improve attendance and participation among all um, ages of youth in your programs. And not to mention that including Youth Voice in all of your activities um, across the board, not just having a Youth Voice activity once a month, but really building that into as an integral component of all of your programs. Um, 
including youth voice and all of these activities can increase social emotional learning in the youth and motivation as well. It can improve their skills and competency development um, because they have this active role in coming up with um, plans and solutions. And then it can also improve the quality of your program because uh, the youth um, are able to do things that are interesting for them. And then we also uh, talked a little bit in this session about how when youth are involved in solving real world problems, the solutions are often better and more accessible. They talked about, um, they provided this example actually about city planning and how they had a bunch of um, really young kids, like five or six year olds talking about that, what they would want in a city. And I think off the bat, we think, oh, little kids really don't have much to add to the conversation. You know, this is a conversation for the grownups or for adults and experts. But when they included youth in the um, in the problem solving and in the design of cities and different um, developments, the youth were able to come up with solutions that were accessible for everyone in the population um, and come up with some really creative things um, that everyone would benefit from. So that's just a little background to take into um, consideration when thinking about why youth voice is important and um, the meaning it can add to your programming and to your projects that you do um, in your after school program. So youth voice is one level, um, but then there's another level which is more advanced and it's called youth participatory action research, which I'm going to call YPAR um, as the speaker did. So YPAR is more intensive than youth voice um, because the youth really become social scientists. They come up with a problem in the world that they want to solve and this is usually social justice related. And it's usually on an issue that matters to youth, like public health, um, mental health or suicide prevention, school reform, substance abuse, real issues for kids, especially older youth, um, middle schoolers and high schoolers are more likely to participate in YPAR because it is another level um, of youth voice. It's a more advanced level. And so, like I said, the youth become social scientists. They come up with this real world problem. They come up with um, a way to collect data about the problem. So they create research parameters, they conduct the research. So maybe the youth come up with a survey that they want to do. They take that survey and they go out into the community um, and do the interviews and do the surveys on their own and um, conduct that research on their own. And then they come back and they're the ones who look at that research and um, analyze it and see what the findings are. And then they create recommendations based on those findings. Maybe they're um, recommending that the city council do something or that the school board take an action. And then if they take it a step further, even yet, and they act on those recommendations. So if they recommend that the city council does something, they go to a city council meeting, present their research and um, create arguments around um, what they're proposing. And so what Crystal just pulled up here are different examples of YPAR that you can use to um, in research to gather voices and perspectives. So this is just something that if you decide you want to go the YPAR route, you can share this with your students um, and with the youth and they can start to understand um, what different methods of research they can take when implementing their research and trying to gather data on a subject. So the thing uh, to think about with YPAR, it can be a little intimidating because you do want to make sure that your research is scientifically sound. Um, that's really a key component here. But I would recommend um, partnering with um, community colleges or universities in your area or in your region. They will have professors there that have the background um, and the acumen in research and um, scientific research and can come in as a community partner and work with your youth to develop unbiased research questions or figure out what they need in a sample size. Um, and this is all really helpful for youth. Not only are they gaining skills in research and um, um, uh, scientific method, but they're also gaining a sense of leadership and a sense of motivation to know that they are able to go out into the community and solve problems. 
And it's actually been proven that um, youth who do YPAR are more likely to stay in that community um, as adults and become leaders. They're the ones who join the city council. They're the ones who joined the school board because they were civically engaged um, and started thinking about these issues at a young age. There are also different levels of YPAR, um, so I don't want you all to be intimidated by the concept. Having students do all of these parts is like peak YPAR, but you can start at a basic level. Maybe the students identify a real world problem and you as the adult, as the facilitator, put together the survey. Or maybe the students put together the survey and you um, help them conduct, conduct it. Whatever it is, uh, it's just a neat, a neat concept to apply to your programs in a way that I think can really be meaningful and actually make change in your communities too. So here, before we move on, I just listed a few different resources that you can go to to see some examples in action of what YPAR looks like and the different kinds of projects youth um, have been active in. And then there's different um, resources like Generation Citizen or um, uh, What Kids Can Do um, to just talk about youth voice and how to get youth involved in um, social issues and issues that impact your local communities. <clears throat> so quite possibly my favorite workshop during the entire conference was on library partnerships. And obviously the presenter was from the Colorado Library Association. Um, it was amazing to me, and maybe it's just because I essentially grew up going to the library like I know many of you did as well. Um, it was a little bit amazing to me that some people did not even think about their local library being a resource for them. So I think the main message or takeaway that they said no less than probably 10 or 15 times during the entire presentations is that libraries are there for you. They are free, or if there is a cost, it's a very minimal cost. So please use them. Libraries have the same goals in many situations that we do uh, in supporting quality before and after school programming. So we need to think about how we can better incorporate their services into our academic and enrichment plans. So clearly libraries have the very typical services that maybe you would think of. So book checkouts, some library programs, kits, activities, things like that. The summer reading theme for 2020 was imagine, it was announced and it will be imagine your story. So one thing that she wanted us to be very, very clear about was that the library can often tailor experiences to your needs and then also can provide that supportive curriculum, development, materials, tools to make your programming successful. So I did include the link here to the Iowa Library Association, which of course is across the entire state. But if you haven't made a connection with your local library, I would, can, I would encourage you to do so. There are many, many different things that the library can do to support you. One of the three things that I took away from this that I thought might be great uh, opportunities for our 21st century sites is uh, one thing that they talked about was the development of what they called exploration backpack kits. So this was literally a backpack uh, that had information in it. There was a kind of a plastic covered uh, animal guide, plant guide, trail guide, um, safety, first aid, things like that. Uh, it also included some very, very basic materials, so perhaps a compass or something to, of that nature. But what they had done in Colorado is when they developed these kits, they actually asked for input from one of their after school programs and the kids helped to build that backpack. So now you can go to any number of libraries in Colorado. You can check this backpack kit out for a determined amount of time, take it to a state park, and in that backpack also includes a, a free day pass for you to access the state park, and you can enjoy all that nature has to offer. And that was done in a partnership with kids, and I thought that was a really cool activity. Um, and I wondered if that would might might be something that we could replicate here in Iowa. So if anybody has an interest in that, let me know because I'm very interested in that. 
Uh, the other type of kits that they developed, whether, so these could have been uh, backpacks or it could have been a, a tote of some kind, were these experience or destination kits. So if you have, um, if you have always wanted to learn how to bake a fancy cake, you could go and check out the kit on baking, which would include recipe cards, the, uh, you know, a fun pan that maybe it's in the shape of a horse or puppy or something like that. Um, instructions, including web links on how to do fancy cake decorating and, and so on and so forth. They also had one for different languages. So there was a learn French type of thing, which included things like um, French music CDs and then also movies that were subtitled in French, as well as some practical applications and a pocket dictionary. And then, of course, they had STEM kits, which I think are fairly common, and I have actually seen those in Iowa. So, again, these are kits that you can check out from your library and uh, use them to implement a STEM activity through after school. And then the last concept that they talked about was uh, there were two sites in the room that shared with the, the collective that they invite their library staff to go on field trips or to participate in events with them. And what that ultimately means is that the, libra the librarian or the library staff that attends those events or goes on those field trips then develops an entire curricula based on that experience. So the example that they used was um, youth who were going to go on a mountain biking experience. So the librarian in this situation uh, found reading materials, she developed a backpack kit, and then they partnered with a third entity to come in and teach the kids how to do some basic mountain bike repair. So for example, how to change a tire, you know, things like that. Um, and then she also did some follow-up uh, activities and experiences with them too, including a, a writing workshop, and a, a couple of other uh, smaller events for those kids. And I just thought that was a really nice community partnership and collaboration. A lot of times libraries have um, specific funding that they can use for youth development or STEM or community outreach. And it might be a good way for you to think about tapping into uh, an existing or a new community partnership for the betterment of the kids in your program. So once again, uh, we're going to take a momentary pause for questions or comments. OK, seeing none, we'll move on. Um, this session was probably probably my favorite session that I attended. It was about um, asset mapping in rural communities and partnerships. I think when we talk to rural communities across the state, uh, there's sometimes a sense that, oh, we don't have anything in my community. How am I going to have community partners or how am I going to provide an enriching um, after school program? I'm not like Des Moines. We don't have access to the zoo and the science center and all of these other um, partners that uh, the capital city has. And this workshop really opened my opened my mind and opened my eyes to everything that's available in rural communities and how um, to look at things differently and to um, see them as assets. And so I think the key takeaway here is that anything could be an asset in your community from um, the person who lives down the street who has a unique hobby uh, to the local grocery store. Um, and so this session was really about a lot of examples that this uh, community in Kansas, uh, this after school program in Kansas does um, and the community partnerships they've created. So just to list a few, uh, they'll take youth um, on a field trip to the local grocery store. And here they'll talk about price comparisons. Um, a lot of kids don't get that um, education in their families or in their households. And so this uh, provides some sense of financial literacy to them and um, prepares them to be successful adults. And you can also turn it into a sort of mathematic enrichment activity too. And then also going to the grocery store to talk about nutritional eating and picking out um, foods that would create a balanced diet. Again, this is not something that every uh, kid gets in their home. So um, providing this education and after school can be really vital. 
they took kids on a field trip to the bus barn, which was right next door to the school, and they got to talk to the mechanics there and learn um, how they work on the buses and see the, um, all of the mechanics and engineering that goes into um, making sure the buses run and get kids to school. Uh, so this was an aspect of career exploration for the kids, um, and a lot of them really enjoyed it. They would take little field trips to the police department so they can learn about safety and the role that police have in the community. This does a lot to build relationships um, and reduce the stigma or maybe fear of police in the community and to see their role um, as a protector of the community and as a positive resource um, for safety. And then it also opens up a, a different career opportunity for kids that may never have thought about um, entering that field. They partner with the local swimming pool, which I know a lot of communities, a lot of our 21st century programs do um, across the state to uh, do swimming lessons at a reduced cost um, because they realize that a lot of kids don't have the money to do this on their own and that water safety is really important, um, especially for youth and you want them to be safe in the water. You can also do physics ex experiments at the pool with buoyancy and um, testing different things like that. Local farms, we have them all over the state. These are a great resource to help kids learn about nutrition and the environment um, and agriculture and thinking about those different fields as a career. Also thinking about how you can engage local farms to provide healthy snacks for your after school program um, and really showing kids where food comes from. I think that's something that um, in our society today, we don't have to think about much. And then of course, going to City Hall, uh, to meet the mayor or to um, see a city council meeting in action to learn about civics and again show kids a new career. And then there's um, just community partners. They talked about how um, an elderly couple really enjoyed gardening in their retirement. So they came and um, built a community garden at the program and worked with the kids once a week and um, um, caring for the garden and teaching them about um, gardening and plants and biology and things like that. There was a rodeo clown in town and he brought his rodeo dog and showed the kids how to train animals. Um, that was a fun one. I think basically what um, we're trying to get at here is that everybody and every different um, community has something to offer for the after school program and all you have to do is ask. Um, and people are likely to not say no to kids and so just making the ask, asking around the community and seeing who's interested in what, um, I think you'll be surprised at what you can find. And in the files tab in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see that we have an um, asset mapping handout that they provided for us in this breakout session. And they had us go through this and um, map out the assets in our own community. So I would um, suggest that if you haven't gone through an activity like this, to uh, use this handout in your programs with your staff um, or with your board of your organization to think through what the assets could be. Um, some you may have tapped already and need to want to expand on or some that um, you might find that are new to you. So um, this is available for your use and I really found this to be a fun activity and again it really opened my eyes. Okay. Let me get back to the PowerPoint. Crystal's on fire with this thing now. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm still doing it right yet, but we'll take a chance. Okay, uh, the next session that I attended was creating a community-wide out-of-school time committee. And this was an interesting uh, presentation. This was uh, from a specific county in Colorado in which there are only well, two communities in this entire county because they're essentially in the heart of the Rocky Mountains. There is a more sizable community and then there's an unincorporated town. And this, uh, this group of people came together for out of school time programming because they wanted to come up with a, that regular platform of collaboration. In short, what they had found is um, you know, if group A was doing something, why would group B replicate the same offering? So what they talked about was when forming a committee like this, so they used the words committee, advisory board, or collaboration kind of interchangeably. 
they said that their overall goal was to meet regularly and then focus on those systems levels improvements. So how collectively did they strategize around applying for funds? Was there a way they could share their professional development resources? Was there a way they could potentially share staffing? Uh, and then of course, leveraging that community support. So again, why would group A do a coat drive and group C do a coat drive when let one of them take the coats and the other one take the gloves or whatever? Um, what they talked about is right away out of the get go, every single agency or organization around the table agreed to have what they called open and honest conversations, meaning um, not that it wasn't, it was never disrespectful, but if this particular organization had an issue with another organization, this was the time that they brought it to the forefront and hashed it out. And I guess I was a little bit taken aback or maybe a little bit leery about that because as a you know, as a society in general, we're not necessarily very quick to call some of our peers out on a particular item or, or interest. But I, I thought that that was an interesting concept and it seems to work really well for them. They all agreed that those meetings, the overall goal of that meeting is to make the best possible outcome for youth. So again, if there was an organization who was doing something that wasn't lending to that overall mission, that's essentially when they were called to the carpet and, and asked to justify themselves or were encouraged to think about changing some of their practice. One thing that they also talked about was when if you're starting a collaboration or if you hit a snag. So if you do have a situation in which you call somebody out and they, you know, maybe disagree or something, they said it could be helpful to incorporate an outside facilitator to work through either starting up the organization or um, building in those resources to handle that particular issue. So their overall approach to this was they wanted to focus on culture first and process second. So using their mission and culture, and then later they developed norms, they had a process and procedure or operations manual and a work plan. And truthfully, um, all of those became living documents at that point then too. So for example, the original work plan that the gentleman shared, the presenter shared with us, I mean, I'm very much a process person, but it kind of put me to shame, to be honest with you. Um, they agreed as a group it was too much. They had bitten off more than they could chew. So they really whittled it down to three main goals for that particular time session. Um, the committee's structure and why collaborations are important to begin with is, again, it better aligns you for some funding opportunities, that program support, coordination nation and then building that best climate for the kids. So one thing that they talked about was there was uh, one entity who provided summertime daytime programming but only had enough funding to support youth from essentially eight in the morning until one o'clock in the afternoon. They did provide them a meal but at one o'clock they just ran out of funding. So at that point through the collaboration, then another partner took over, took the kids from one to five and was able to do some additional program supports with them. While a third partner offered snack and um, some enrichment type activities. So again, the entire collaboration came together for the overall benefit of the kids. Okay. Great. So the next session um, was do more with less, increasing rural after school capacity through AmeriCorps. And this session was really an, introductor, an introduction to AmeriCorps programs um, in Colorado, but really it applies to AmeriCorps across the country. And I think AmeriCorps um, programming can really be beneficial for urban communities too, in addition to rural communities. AmeriCorps members can help build the capacity of any organization and allow you to serve more youth um, and build up the quality of your program. Um, and I also think that introducing AmeriCorps to the youth in your programs provides them another avenue and another um, opportunity and option for their futures too. So just that exposure to service I think is really important for youth. 
So there are three different types of AmeriCorps programs, um, and they can get a little complicated in eligibility and what they do. Um, so I just wanted to touch on each of them briefly. So the first is NCCC, um, AmeriCorps. And so this is a team of service members. Um, so you'll get a team, if you were, were interested in this program, you would get a team of AmeriCorps members that would serve at your site for two to three months. So I think this is really ideal for a summer program. Um, and they'll do anything really um, from painting to working directly with kids to um, building gardens. Um, they really are diverse in what they can do and they go all across the country. These teams um, have different placements across the country throughout their, I think they do nine months of service or so. Uh, and the thing is, is that the host site is responsible for housing the team. Um, but this doesn't mean you need to pay for apartments for each member. They have lived in church basements. They've lived in um, empty school dorms. Uh, really, anywhere that has running water and access to a kitchen is basically the bare minimum requirement for that. Um, they bring their own cots and everything. So this is an interesting option if you have a summer program that you're really trying to expand or a special project you want to um, get involved with or you want to implement. I think that NCCC is a good short-term um, option for you. AmeriCorps state programs, um, they AmeriCorps state members are involved in direct service and their types, the types of service vary by state and vary by program. So in Iowa, you've probably heard of Reading Corps. Um, there's like a Green Corps that focuses on the environment. Uh, there's all sorts of different AmeriCorps programs. Um, with the members doing different things. At, through the Iowa After School Alliance starting last summer, we started AmeriCorps program um, to place members in uh, summer programs to help build the quality of the programs and build um, high quality lessons and activity plans. Um, and we're planning on doing that again this year. So if this is something you'd be interested in, please reach out to me, Brittany Samuelson, um, and we can talk more about the cost share for that and um, what that looks like and how it might be a good fit for your program. And so with AmeriCorps State, these service terms can last anywhere from three months to year long terms of service. Um, for our specific program with the Iowa After School Alliance, it's three months. Um, and it's nice that we're the program provider for that because we take care of all of the administrative um, details that come along with a federal grant, which is a lot for this one. Um, and so basically you just get the benefits of having a member at your program and there are a few things you have to do as far as evaluation, but um, it's really pretty, um, it's not very burdensome for sites to host a member. And then the third option with AmeriCorps is AmeriCorps VISTA. AmeriCorps VISTA serve for a whole year typically and their mission is to build capacity of organizations and um, to alleviate poverty. And so um, AmeriCorps VISTAs really don't do a lot of direct service, um, but maybe the, you'll place a VISTA in your program to figure out how to attract more kids to your program or um, work on recruitment and retention issues with your staff. Um, there are a lot of different ways this could look. And I think if you're interested in any of these programs at all, um, if you're interested in summer ladders, talk to me, but if you're interested in um, doing something outside of the Summer Ladders program, um, the staff at Volunteer Iowa are really helpful and will help you um, understand which program might be a good fit for you and what kind of um, service you'd want an AmeriCorps member to do. Okay, <clears throat> the next session that I intended was engaging high school students in after school programming. And um, just kind of a side note, the Family Engagement Committee actually will be developing an ad hoc committee to focus specifically on engaging middle school and high school parents. So I'm hoping to take some of this data and information to that particular group, which will be sending out notifications for anybody who's interested in that soon. So this uh, presentation came out of Tennessee and they have found success in incorporating after school programming that will really lend to that lifelong experience that high school students are looking for. So their, their kind of message or takeaway was to make it worth their time 
And by that, what they mean is you'll graduate it on time, graduate on time to make it worth your future. Uh, Tennessee actually has a state goal of increasing ACT scores to a composite score of 21 by the year 2025 and to make it worth their pocketbook. So many of the partners that they engage with will also pay students for their time or uh, work while they're engaged in that after school program opportunity. So they used a three prong approach in Tennessee. The first was credit recovery and remedial services. Um, so those were done every day, but of course there was a different focus on each day. So might be math Mondays, reading Tuesdays, and so on and so forth. And of course that program uh, had a lot of rigidity. It was very structured. It was very uh, academically focused. And within that, um, they saw some really nice growth from kids who participated in those programs. The second prong of their approach was to do ACT testing prep. And the one thing that I found very interesting was that at this particular school district, which was located in the western side of Tennessee, the football coach, men's and women's basketball coach and cheerleading coaches actually made it mandatory for their <laughs> athletes to participate in this program. Because one thing that they had determined was that there were many, many youth who had uh, amazing athletic talent, but didn't have the academic support to really take it to the next level and play at the college level. So by helping them with making connections to remedial services if needed, and then to help them score better on their ACTs, then they were really opening that future for those particular kids. And the last component was workplace learning opportunities. So these were areas that youth could explore if they had an interest that would potentially lead to a career or lead to the educational experience that they were looking for. So one program that they had had a lot of success with was a tutoring program. They identified high school students who were interested in becoming teachers. They then went through a training session, uh, multiple training sessions with them, and then those high school students were allowed to uh, work with after school programs to tutor the elementary age students within the district. They then took it a step further by incorporating their input into parent teacher conferences. They were expected to uh, look and assist with lesson planning. Um, essentially, they were junior teaching staff is what they were. And then um, that also helped them to earn credit they needed towards graduation. So because that program was so successful, they planned to roll out programs around auto mechanics, a CNA program, and then uh, the CNA program will actually be the next program that they roll out at this district in Tennessee. And they were very excited because in addition to getting credit and working towards that certification, then youth could also earn, I, I want to say it was nine or ten dollars an hour, which for that particular community was a pretty good wage for a high school student. Um, again, I know in Iowa we have some similar programs uh, to what they spoke about in Tennessee, but I, many of those I think are school day opportunities. So I do think that this is an area that we could potentially expand upon for after school. And if anybody does existing program like this, maybe reach out to me individually because I'd like to really pick your brain about this. Um, we've also talked internally here about uh, incorporating more CTE uh, experiences and opportunities for youth. So that might be an area that the Iowa After School Alliance chooses to move towards in the near future. Okay, folks, we're going to keep moving. Uh, but again, if any questions at any time, please let us know. Great. So this slide looks like a lot, but um, I won't go in too much detail. This session is really about utilizing child nutrition programs at your site. So we know that um, not every kid has a, a reliable source of food or dinner um, when they go home. And so after school can really bridge that gap for them and make sure they have full tummies um, and can learn um, and um, eat nutritional food too. And so I just wanted to touch on three different federal child nutrition funding programs that your program may be eligible for. 
There's the Child and Adult Care Food Program, um, CACFP is what that's called. I know many of you use utilize this program um, at your sites. There's also the After School Snack Program, and then the Summer Food Service Program. Um, schools or community organizations can apply to be a summer food service site um, in the summer that feeds uh, students in your program, but then also families um, and others if they need it. Uh, if you're interested in any of these, I think um, let us know, reach out to us. Some of the eligibility can get a little complicated on some of these different programs, and it also can be a little complicated to administer uh, these programs. So if there's a lot of interest among you all, the network and these programs, Crystal and I can do some research with the Iowa Department of Education and Iowa Department of Public Health on these different um, programs or um, do some network sharing with you all about best practices too. So just keep us posted if that's something you'd want to learn more about. In Colorado, they just did um, a study to identify challenges um, to increasing participation in these child and child nutrition programs that I mentioned. And some of these challenges I thought would be pretty universal to folks in Iowa too. So one is student taste. The kids didn't like the food that was being served. Another is stigma. They felt embarrassed that they had to go to the summer food service program to get their meal. Another is timing. Maybe they were the program was serving food at the time that an athletic practice was happening. Alternative options. Maybe there was a McDonald's close to the program and the kids would rather go there. And then another is lack of out-of-school time programs. Without an out-of-school time program in the community, there isn't really an entity that can support these different nutrition programs. And then finally, the operations and administration of these programs. Um, I touched on it a little bit earlier, but some of these programs, because they are federal, um, you guys know how federal grants and federal programs can be, it can be a little bit complicated. Um, and that can be a burden on some programs for participation. So they also collected some best practices for increasing participation um, in using these programs. And one was getting students involved in the development of the menu. I think whether you're involved in these federal programs or not, or you're just serving snacks or dinner in your program, this is a great um, practice to implement. Kids are more likely to eat the food when they have some say in what they're going to be eating. I think that's pretty much common sense, but it never really occurred to me that that was a good practice to do, so I wanted to share that with you all. Uh, also, coordinating with other OST programs to share the administrative burden and to reach more kids. You know, um, if we're all trying to do this alone, it can be really hard, and it's a lot of time for each organization to put into administering. But if we can share and um, partner and share resources and work with schools and community organizations, it can make that a lot more realistic for more people and help you reach more kids, which is obviously the ultimate goal. And then finally, um, they also talked about just using different service models. One program used had a food truck donated, and so they'd serve the same food out of the food truck, and you know the kids just thought that was cool, so they were more likely to eat out of that. So just being creative, I know we don't all have access to food trucks, but um, you get the sentiment there. And then finally, partnering with the local food bank. Um, the Food Bank of the Rockies presented during this session, and they discussed that they were um, a sponsor for the CACFP and the Summer uh, Food Service Program. And uh, they would uh, do the compliance checks for sites. So they would really take on that administrative burden. So all the sites had to worry about was serving the food, and um, they would come in and make sure you had all the documentation you need and provide that technical assistance. They also do backpack, backpack programs for youth, which I know a lot of you do in your programs as well. And they do farm to youth programming, um, where they work with local farms and make sure that um, and see if they can get food that's locally grown um, sent home with kids or used in snack during their programs. So if you don't have a partnership with your local food bank, I think that's a really good place to start, to start and to see what kind of um, capacity they have to help support you. And again, we have uh, additional handouts that we have not shared through this PowerPoint, but we will make sure that they are available to you on the website as well. 
Um, the last session that I attended was using a community design model to build programs. And this was actually very similar to building the out of school time uh, collaboration. So I'm going to hit just a, a couple of reminders on this one and then we'll be uh, close to the wrap up. So uh, the one thing that I took away from this one is that collaboration again takes that intentional dialogue. So she, the presenter from this one, who was actually from Colorado, pointed out that high quality design teams really have uh, characteristics that make them successful. And those are listed on your screen right now. So those being the community led, utilizing feedback on that continuous loop, having a transparent decision making process and being adaptable with that process, as well as with uh, programming and meeting flexibility and so on and so forth. Um, include diverse voices, and by that her comment was in all definitions of diverse. So making sure that you have a nice diverse representation of your community on your committee or advisory board can be very, very helpful. And then to strengthen those connections through internal rituals and support. Um, in this, in this sense, uh, ritual had to do more with process and procedure. So I think perhaps I would have chosen a slightly different word there, but that's okay. Um, she said she really encouraged us to think outside the box, but also thinking about that human connection. So one thing that they had talked about was they had this really big planning meeting coming up. They knew that there was this bad weather snowstorm event that was going to happen. She actually took it upon herself to bake cookies and mail cookies to all of the program participants prior to the meeting. I am not telling you you should do that. <laughs> it's not necessarily best practice. It's kind of nice. I'm going to leave that up to everybody here on the call today. <laughs> um, but one tip she did have was to formulate those questions ahead of time and use those agendas, but have that level of flexibility. So the closing session uh, that we attended in, was on the topic of chronic absenteeism, which I know is also an interesting um, topic that's brought up here in Iowa at multiple levels. So what we learned from this was that the two primary factors of student success are attendance and parent engagement. So um, chronic absenteeism was defined as missing 10% or more days in a school year. So it depended upon what state was represented. Ultimately that looked at like 18 to 20 different days uh, across the attendees there. We know that chronic absenteeism has direct connections to school performance, including third grade reading proficiency and high school graduation rates. And one thing that we that the presenter spent quite a bit of time talking about was how to engage parents in equitable ways. So this means targeting all parents or guardians, not just the moms. And that was a, a really uh, strong point that she made is we um, we have an increasing number of stay at home dads. We have an increasing number of parents who are maybe working different shifts. So we need to be conscious of our language and our approach to making sure that both moms and dads or guardians are uh, comfortable in how we approach them. She also spoke about being culturally relevant and sensitive. So providing those materials in the language that is spoken within those particular homes and then making sure that we're meeting their needs. So are we scheduling meetings during their work times? Do we need to think about meeting option A, meeting option B, you know, a first shift, second shift type of thing. And then whenever possible, food and childcare can be huge uh, ways to overcome barriers. She said that parent misconception leads to uh, chronic absenteeism and the misconceptions that parents often have is they underestimate how many days their child has missed. They hold the belief that other students in the class are performing worse than their child. They don't believe that missing a day or two, especially if we're talking about those kindergarten, first grade, second graders, means very much. I think there's a, a maybe a misconception about the learning that takes place during those grades. And then some parents disbelieve that missing a few days every month is okay. So one thing that she spoke um, about just kind of giving us a snippet of was this nudge theory, which is a, a concept that was developed by Dr. Todd Rogers. 
So this is a theory that basically says that if we believe as a group of people, and that can be defined in a lot of different ways, that we're going to be held accountable, meaning we're going to be tracked or monitored, we will then conform as long as we have support to do so. So the two examples that are probably most common used for nudge theory is your electric bill and those speed limit signs that have the flashing message, message on them. So you're driving down the road, the speed limit is 35 and you are going 37, that sign is gonna flash at you and says, tells you slow down, slow down. Um, most of us at that point then slow down because again, we've been we've been made to believe that we're being tracked or monitored to change that progress. Your electric bill might include a bar graph that says this is how much energy your neighbors used compared to how much you have used. Um, and again, internally, then we take that information and when we leave the room the next time we shut off the lights. So ways that we can support that nudge theory is to use more simplified forms. So an opt out version versus the opt in version can oftentimes be much more successful for uh, getting participation. And then auto populating as many of those forms and tracking documents as possible. And I think I would just add something that's important about nudge theory is that the pressure is internal rather than external. If you're sending a letter home, which I think Crystal's about to get to, mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't be trying to judge or um, um, make the parent feel bad about their child's absences, but it's rather just sharing information without any type of um, judgment attached to it. And even though you're not saying any or providing any pressure other than the facts internally because of how um, we behave socially, uh, the parent will do that on their own. Yes. So nudge theory can also, it's a behavioral science approach. And when you incorporate that with your attendance plan, you really can see some pretty good outcomes. So one, one district in uh, Colorado actually sent out what they called nudge letters. They were formatted very similarly to that electric bill. So, um, but the, the warning that they gave us was that the, that really needed to be sent to the right family at the right time. So for example, don't send a nudge letter between Thanksgiving and Christmas. It, it's a short amount of time. Nothing's going to happen in that time. You're not going to see the improvement. Um, and then the, the second comment behind that was that a nudge letter who is sent to a family who often changes addresses um, probably won't get that letter. So then therefore it becomes ineffective at that point. Uh, hallway posters, infographics, newsletter items can be effective. So the example behind that was, you know, how is our school or grade doing? And then where does your child fit in? I actually saw this happen once at a school in Cedar Rapids where they had a very similar poster and you could actually see parents who are counting on their fingers silently in their head, um, checking to see how many days their student had missed versus the, the kids in the class. And then incentives was another discussion that we had. Um, so they could potentially be appropriate, but we need to watch out because sometimes incentives backfire on you. So you have to be very careful if you implement these. For example, she talked about letters of recognition. So when, when you provide a student with a letter of recognition, so way to go, Johnny, you've attended for the last two weeks. At that point, it might become misread uh, by a parent in thinking that, oh, awesome, I'm doing fine. He can miss the next two or three days of school and not have a problem. Um, the letter of recognition also becomes what they refer to as a social artifact at that point. And again, uh, if used appropriately, that can really, it really does incentivize behavior and attendance. But if, if it's, um, misread by a parent, it can have that backfire effect. Okay, so thank you everybody. That was a rather lengthy webinar, uh, but we appreciate you sticking with us. Do we have any questions from the group today? Okay, and it looks like maybe we have a comment that's being typed, so we'll wait just a moment for that to pop up. I think overall, I would say that we gained a lot from this conference when thinking about how um, rural communities 
might start or improve their programming. But I think a lot of what we learned applies across the board, no matter the size of your community. And I hope that a lot of you probably are doing some of these things already, but I hope that you gained at least one or two things um, that you can take back to maybe improve your programming or spark a new idea or think about something differently because that this conference really did that for both of us. Yes. And then, of course, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is if at any time there was a particular uh, session that you would maybe like more information on, you can always reach out to Brittany or myself. We're happy to do a separate conference call or, um, again, if we're going to be in your area, we're even happy to swing by and have a meeting with you as well. So it looks like the comments that have come in are just uh, thank you comments. So you're very welcome. And we're happy to have provided the information to you for this. And thank you for bearing with us with the technical difficulties. <laughs> I think we're going to be better from now on. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. Have a great Thanksgiving, um, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.